That's the point of tier one intervention is to create this environment inclusive and accessible to all, but not stripping the complexity out of the mathematics. Hello everyone, I'm Sherry Dutter and I'm here with John Lee Panzik and we are here at Tier 1 Interventions and we are so glad to have you here today. We have a good bit of content today that we're going to roll out to you. We're going to lay some foundation though and define what is Tier 1 Intervention and we're going to start by Sherry and I are going to converse a little bit about that crazy C word that seems like it keeps coming back and that is COVID. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing that we're starting with that conversation, but I think it's necessary. I believe that it keeps coming back even years later because I believe that it is an effect that has been on humans since 2020 and it's, drastically changed our emotions, our mindsets, our practices, our thinking. And the first thing that I want to say about COVID in its relation to tier one interventions is tier one being whole class general classroom instruction, meaning for the last probably dozen years or so, we've moved more to inclusion model in schools, which means mainstream. We want every kid, regardless of ability, deficit, struggle, we want them to experience whole classroom, regular general instruction, which we're going to call tier one. Tier one is whole classroom, regular classroom. And I will say that prior to COVID, in math and writing, tier one was not where it should be, regardless of COVID. I actually got a little excited post-COVID because I thought this is a chance to reframe what regular classroom tier one looks like, feels, sounds, and now we can move forward with growth on serving all kids in this tier one inclusion model. But my fear has come to be, and that is we've regressed back to where we were prior to COVID. And I think that in many classrooms, we've defaulted back to even pre-COVID where it was not instruction for inclusion at all. It is time today and for all of these sessions to have these conversations. That was a lot. Sherry, you asked me to share a little bit, but that was a lot. And I know that you have some specifics for writing, but Sherry, let's just talk you and I a little bit about how COVID has affected schools, students, and especially our students with learning specialties. Sure. As I was contemplating and thinking about the impact of COVID on my students and job in general, one thing I reflected back on as an OT, my generally across the country and even in other parts of the world, OT caseloads were escalating even before COVID. We were hearing conversations of OTs having 100 kids on their caseload. And I'm like, how do you do that and treat the child with efficiency and meet the goals the way they're supposed to be met? Because it's impossible to see 100 kids as an OT and to do sessions with them that are those small groups. We see a lot of kids more in the tier three, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but that's more like a one-on-one -on -one session. We generally can do like a two-on-one, -on -one, but Medicaid doesn't allow us to do bigger groups unless we adjust time. Like there's so, a lot of rules about the way we are allowed to treat kids. And I know... 
So I worked in cyber before COVID hit. So cyber had its own issues. I know my kids went to cyber. So I know that there was 165 kids in a English class, general ninth grade English for one of my kids. And I can't remember, I think it was Michael's class. And I'm like, for the teacher, that's a lot of work to be greeting Romeo and Juliet 165 times. But yet you break that down. There is no feasible way that a physically an OT could work one-on-one with a kid. Because a lot of what I was doing, even in the world of cyber, I was going to their home, which is where they went to school. And I was doing direct treatment. I'm physically in a home for one hour, one-on-one with a kiddo. With the travel time. With plus travel time. And typically there was an hour between kids. So just that's the way, that's the nature of being in home health, home environment setting. Even when I worked in home health with adult rehab, there were sometimes I was traveling two hours between clients. So... (sighs) I I say that, and yes, I did work in a brick and mortar building as well. And I was maxed out. My brain was maxed out trying to manage 15. Now, I know Teresa's on this call. She has a caseload, nearly 100 kids that she's trying to manage. But the difference between that kind of a her caseload and sometimes what i was referring to was that she is the ot she has an an occupational therapy assistant supporting her with some of the students so that a code is doing some of the work as a math teacher you don't get a math assistant teacher <laughs> helping you out but the the way the structure is with OT to teaching is a little bit different. So when I heard these caseloads going on, I'm like, how can we change? How can we make it so that it's reasonable? And that's when I started delving into what can we do in the kindergarten classroom to collaborate, co-teach, and potentially up front our intervention so that we can help cover these kids that are going to struggle potentially later by giving them intensive instruction. And when I go to all of the research on the science of reading, That's exactly what structured literacy is designed to do. It's to create intensive reading instruction so that down the road, we can decrease the number of tier two and tier three. And obviously tier two and tier three are never going to be eliminated. No. But as you talk about, Sherry, prior to COVID, Not only are occupational therapist caseloads increasing, but the number of kids with math needs were increasing. Then COVID hits, and then we're out of control with the number of kids that have needs. So either the kids have to change or we have to change. And what Sherry and I are promoting is that we in schools in tier one regular classroom make changes so that the bottom line is we are able to serve more kids in less time with more frequency and not eliminate, but reduce the number of students for needs at the tier two, tier three level. And we'll define these tiers in a moment more specifically. But right now, I just want Sherry and I to have this conversation that I want everybody listening to just hear the conversation as a thought-provoking exercise. So the point of tier one is to be able to serve more kids in less time through this collaborative process. Let me talk about what I do, what Sherry does. I am- Can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah, go ahead. And what struck me about math class is I had this experience one day 
And it hit me like a lead brick. I was actually, well, while I was writing handwriting, brain, body disconnect, I was substitute teaching. And I was, I took a, a job in a learning support classroom. So I was the learning support teacher for the day. One of the students, I had to shadow them into math class. <laughs> and I had already known you or I was just getting to know you. At hey, that we point. know so math was... class is broken, Sherry. So just lay <laughs> it on us here. <laughs> so, but So that was like 2018-ish that this happened and I'm going, whoa, I can see where this kid is struggling. Now he was in a pre-algebra class. So he was in ninth grade, which was not my typical. I usually was uh, taking elementary kids when I was doing the substitute teaching, but they had asked me and they were like, I need some support today. So I took the job and I ended up doing a lot of OT for not just that kid in the class, but several other of the other kids in that class. And the teacher went, where did you come from? <laughs> and, and had no idea where I was trying to intervene and not stop the math class. But yet I needed to, because he was going a mile a minute. And I think this is one of those scenarios that we talk about in Math Disconnected. And for anybody who is listening, I know that might take us off on a tangent, but when I think it was one of those things that we were talking about as we were developing that story where the math teacher gets derailed by the therapist because the therapist is coming in making suggestions on how to change the entire classroom to make it more accessible for all students. Boom. Absolutely. That's of tier one intervention is to create this environment inclusive and accessible to all, but not stripping the complexity out of the mathematics. And what we are going to bring to you today through tier one instruction, tier one intervention, is how to increase the complexity of the mathematics. So we're going to actually have our most struggling kids learning more, understanding more, and being able to decipher more math symbols and notations that are their biggest struggle. We're going to increase the complexity for all, but we're also going to increase the accessibility at the same time. Too good to be true? It's not. That's what we're bringing to you today. And that is exactly what tier one means with Sherry being occupational therapist from this medical world, from this neuroscience world, from this brain-based world, and myself, John Lee, being from the educational world, general classroom teacher, as we begin to have these conversations, and then we've had these conversations over time, we realize that what we're doing in our own worlds without the connection of each other is not serving these kids long-term. So through our collaboration and through Sherry's therapies and math interventions together, what we bring to you is the post-COVID miracle math classroom, for lack of a better phrasing. And I know, Sherry, you talked, you always are talking to me about the execution of writing, the fall of writing. Sherry, talk to us a little bit about how in 2009, like way prior to COVID, the effects that legislation had on writing in the classroom. And I'll make that connection to the mathematics. And I know it sounds like, oh my gosh, in this first 30 minutes, we're just, we're like, massaging the problem, but it's the elephant in the room. We've got to talk about these things. And then for the following two hours, it's going to be all solution based. But Sherry, talk about some of the catastrophe that happened with writing and explicit writing instruction or lack thereof. And then I'll parallel that to mathematics and why this has affected tier one instruction as well. My entire career has been funding changes. 
So I want to, I'm even going to take it back a little step further because Perfect. when yes. I graduated from college in the late nineties, I entered acute care as they were changing all the fundings and all the regulations from, you could treat kid, people as long as you want. And that's when they were trying to minimize the amount of time that you spend in the hospital. <coughs> so we went from this large gap of time spent in a hospital, enter, uh, acute care, we start DRGs. So don't worry about what the definitions is with those, but it, they were trying to shorten hospital stay. I moved my, progressed my life over to long-term care. The whole medical world shifted and now they were implementing the same DRGs in, in subacute uh, and acute and uh, long-term care. And so I worked with that a while. By the time I get to home care, they did the same thing with DRGs. And I'm going, when am I going to get free of this limiting my ability to do work? I transitioned over to pediatrics and doggone it, don't they come up with a thing called Common Core? So around the time that I was starting to work in pediatrics, school-based therapy, I was also working early intervention zero to two. So I was going out to homes and I'm working with babies, toddlers. Don't they do the same thing where they have similar, they don't call it the same, but DRGs, which were the limiting the thing to babies and toddlers, which happened around 2009. And what happened was when babies were having a, a de developmental delay, they would come out and there were six domains. And don't ask me to recall those domains right at the moment because I forgot to pull that up and list them out because I can never remember them. Anyway, long-term short is within those six domains, if there was one of them that there was 25% delay, they could get therapy for that area. So it could have been that they needed learning support. So they would get an actual special education teacher who was zero to two trained. So I don't know where you get that specific training in education. I think you have to go back and get a master's degree, but beside both point, so you could get that. If they had gross motor skills, they were getting PT, speech delay, speech therapy, and then OT would do fine motor and play. <clears throat> While that was happening, I was also working school system and we were doing pretty good. And then around 2012, this thing called Common Core hit. And I'm like, what is going on? And that's when the escalation started. So the combination of Octel's, so the kids hitting first, second grade, having that decrease in that percentage, because so I forgot to say was that with the change in Octel, it was now overall 25%. So it wasn't just one area, it was overall 25%. So you could have still had a 30% delay in fine motor skills and not get therapy. Mm. So now these kids were hitting kindergarten, first grade. I'm working with these kids and I'm getting more referrals for, for kindergarten and first grade that they're struggling with fine motor skills. In comes Common Core. And we get escalated and all of a sudden the caseloads are starting to go crazy across the board in occupational therapy. And we're like, what in the world is happening? As far as it fine motor, handwriting, those types of things. And because it was not direct in the curriculum anymore. And so thank you for referring my brain back to what happened in Common Core is the writing standards do not specifically say handwriting instruction they say text and font and the way it's worded it does not say that somebody needs to be able to read and write in a handwritten font all of a sudden all these other demands were coming on the teachers Handwriting got pushed and pushed and pushed. And all of a sudden, there's just no time in the day to do 
the recommended 20 minutes of handwriting instruction, which is what the research says. The research says 20 minutes of handwriting practice per day improves long-term handwriting. It also improves memory and retention skills. Boom. Let's not just like breeze by that. Mm -hmm. It also improves memory and retention skills. Nalima says, Tier 1 Interventions was a sensitizing workshop. Systematically thought through, put into an easy-to-understand framework, and well-presented. Thank you to you both. Thank you, Nalima. You've been listening to Tier 1 Interventions with John Elise Suspanzik and Sherry Daughter. Tier 1 Interventions is released on the first and third Tuesday of the month. The podcast is recorded live on the third Saturday of each month except July. The first segment of the podcast is released to your favorite podcast app. To hear the entire workshop, go to tier1interventions.com and register for our mailing list to get all the news about the next episode. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode's release. Do us a favor, give us a five-star rating and write a review. Every vote matters. I'm Nicholas King, an intern for Sherry Daughter Educational Consulting. 